board. Still on the board. Thank you. Every Friday for the past 13 years, Doris Belovich, Janine Seiples, Laverne Lentz, and Marianne Catholic have been meeting at the Tri-City Senior Center in Middleburg Heights. They play some bridge, they share a laugh, and they reminisce about the Cleveland of days gone by. We could buy a double dip ice cream cone at Cooked's Drugstore for a nickel. But if we wanted to really stretch it, we would get one dip for three cents, save the two cents, and then my dad would give us a penny so that in a couple of days we could get another cone, really. But steak was three pounds, round steak, three pounds for a dollar at Kroger's, which was across the street from our barbershop. Bread at Sadowski Bakery was three cents a loaf. I remember that distinctly, homemade hot bread. I remember at that time there were many I, I suppose maybe now you'd call them bums, but they, you know, they rode the rails. And very often, uh, for Sunday dinner, one of those men would be at our table. My yeah. mother, we, you know, we didn't have that kind of uh, food, but whatever was on our table, my mother and dad shared it with yes. one of these people, you know. My father used to make wine and root beer oh, and yes. beer. And yes. if he didn't do it right, you'd hear, you'd be eating in the kitchen and you'd hear pop in the basement because the bottles are exploding. <laughs> Every Sunday we would have to go visit our relatives on the east side and we'd get all dressed up with our hats and our gloves and, and, and our little purses and my mother and dad would take us all the way to the east side and that was hours. You'd have to take like three or four streetcars and you had to get a transfer to go from one to the other and we'd go way out to Collinwood. Now that was pretty far. Streetcars. Today you'd have to visit a museum like Trolleyville, USA in Olmsted Township to ride one. But back in the 1930s and 40s, they were the last word in transportation. The first electric streetcar hit the streets of Cleveland in 1889. And by the height of their popularity during the Second World War, most everyone was riding the rails of the old Cleveland transit system. As Clevelanders went about the routine tasks of their everyday lives, the old streetcars welcomed them with the kind of fine craftsmanship that is rare in today's age of fiberglass and plastic. Artisans at Cleveland's G.C. Coleman Car Company crafted the walls and handrails out of rich cherry wood. The streetcars featured bouncy rattan seats and fare boxes with a little stool nearby for the conductor. But collecting fares wasn't the conductor's only duty. Each conductor was also responsible for stoking the coal stove that heated the streetcar. And my father tells a great story, one of, the, one of his favorites. In as late as 1949, he had a gentleman visit from outside Cleveland who got off the train at the Pennsylvania station at East 55th and Euclid and took the streetcar from there down to the terminal where he worked. And the gentleman got off the elevator and my dad was standing there and he had kind of a startled look on his face and my dad inquired as to why he was looking like this. He said, did that streetcar have a coal stove in 1949? All the other cities had gotten rid of these things years before, and the Cleveland transit system soldiered on with these old coal stoves, and they f finally ran their last in 1951. <laughs> My memories are mostly of the early 50s on Euclid Avenue when I would go down in, in Christmas time with my mother to Sterling Linder Davis to see the big tree, and uh, we would always take the streetcar, and to me, to her, the tree was the big thing. To me, the streetcar ride was the big thing. <laughs> Blaine Hayes fell in love with trolleys as a boy. And the study of Cleveland's streetcar system is his life's passion. So I guess it's no coincidence that he works for the RTA. He recently published a book on the history of Cleveland's transit system. There were things about the cars there were aromas, there were sensations, there were, there were sights about the old trolleys that are missing today in an in a aluminum fast-paced bus that rushes along a freeway. And, and you, it just takes away also the people thing of 
getting together with other people in the morning and having conversations where in a private automobile you miss that when you talk about streetcars in cleveland there's probably no topic that comes up more often than the subway on the second deck of the detroit superior bridge the last streetcar ran through that subway in 1954 and the tunnel has been sealed up ever since but to this day, greater Clevelanders fondly recall riding through those subterranean tunnels near Public Square on streetcars that are now just phantom ghosts. And I have distinct memories of climbing aboard a streetcar on Madison or on Detroit or on Clifton and for 10 cents going downtown, which was a great deal in those days. And uh, I remember how those cars used to shake, rattle, and roll down the street. And when we got to the high-level bridge, we would look through the windows down at the Cuyahoga Valley, at the Cuyahoga River, and just, in my mind, I wondered, well, what on earth is holding this bridge up if I can see through down to the river? Another thing that used to happen all the time was the high-level bridge subway had ramps that led down into the subway, and people would drive down in there constantly at night because they couldn't see they didn't realize that it wasn't paved and they would be driving on the ties and going up and down like this. So they were, uh, the Cleveland Transit was constantly pulling with a crane. They would be constantly pulling cars out of the subway portals. So those were some of the things that happened in those days that were just part of the, part of everyday life in the 30s that it's lost today. You don't see it. Another thing you just don't see today is kids catching a free ride but it was a common sight back in the heydays of the Cleveland trolley system. See, streetcars used to protrude in the back a little bit, something like a bumper. And then sometimes they'd have another coach where, where they could hook on. But then they have another, you could stand on that buckle there. We'd catch that streetcar and, and ride all the way as far as we could go. Yes, kids used to have all kinds of adventures on the streetcars. A favorite experiment for many young boys was pulling the trolley line off the overhead cable to see exactly what would happen. So to prove that indeed the trolley was actually powering this car, we had to pull the trolley off the wire. So I was running through Lakewood quite close to my home and uh, just started up and a number of us got behind it and pulled the rope and the trolley came off the wire and made all kinds of sparks. It scared the bejeevers out of us, and the car stopped. And therefore, I knew for sure that that's where the power was coming from. Streetcars were a fixture in every Cleveland neighborhood for the first half of the 20th century. So what led to the demise of the cheery yellow trolleys? One theory involves a decision made by a General Motors executive in 1925. The story goes that this executive wanted to find a way to boost automobile sales. And so General Motors bought up railway companies throughout the country, determined to dismantle the streetcar industry. But that's only part of the story. There was also the factor of economics. The maintenance of the rails in the street, the overhead wires, was very expensive. Along came a bus which had no rails, which had no wire, no need for substations. It carried almost as many people. And instead of buying new streetcars and refurbishing the railway system, they just decided to go cheap and buy the buses. So in the early 1950s, one by one, the streetcars were replaced by modern buses. And on January 24th, 1954, Cleveland's last streetcar ran down Madison Avenue. And when it brought its passengers to their final destination on that cold winter night, it also brought with it the end of an era. Well, we had a nice home on Washington Boulevard, a bungalow right near Cottage Grove. But in those days, there was no such thing as natural gas heat. And we heated our home with coal. And I have a very clear memory of the coal uh, delivery car frequently coming into our, into our driveway on Washington Boulevard. We had an opening, a chute uh, on the driveway in which the uh, coal would be shoveled from the truck down the chute with a cloud of black smoke <laughs> that was all over the place and uh, it would wind up in the bottom in the basement of our of our home we take it for granted now all you do is to raise a thermostat in your home and it's nice and warm and comfortable but it wasn't that way we didn't have any thermostats there you couldn't control the, the heat 
by a thermostat. The only way you could control it was by shoveling some more coal on the fire. <laughs> and all the things that, that brought about. So that, that made it a pretty uh, exciting experience. And frequently the same company which supplied uh, coal in the uh, wintertime supplied ice in the summertime. Very few, if any of us, who lived in Cleveland Ice had refrigerators in those days, had electric refrigerators. We had ice boxes. The ice man uh, was a strong man who had tongs, and he had an ice pick. And he would go to, the, he'd go to the, each of his customers, find out whether the person wanted 25 pounds or 50 pounds or maybe even 75 pounds or 100 pounds. And then he'd go back to his ice truck. He'd take off the tarp, which covered all the ice to keep it from melting in the summertime. And he'd take his pick, he'd pick, it out, pick out a, the, the, the appropriate size of ice, put his tongs on it and put it over his shoulder. He had a leather thing he wore on his shoulder because otherwise the ice would be darn heavy and cold on his shoulder, put on his shoulder, then he went up to the uh, customer. It was at that point that I and a few of my other friends would always trail the ice truck around because in the process of using that ice pick to cut off the piece of ice that he needed, he always left some slivers of ice there. And we had loved to grab a sliver of ice and to suck it. That was our popsicle without any flavor, I guess you might say.